It's a beautiful late July day in the garden, and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. I'm Liz Davey, and I'm in my herb garden, and it, as I said, is a beautiful day, and we can pick all of our herbs at this point. It's really a joy to have herbs to work with in the kitchen that are fresh. All I have to do is walk out the door with my clippers and I have all the herbs that I could want in my garden. This year we've had a lot of rain. Uh, some years this garden by the end of July is looking pretty sad because it doesn't get too much water if it doesn't rain due to water restrictions and bans here in Norfolk. I can only water it a limited amount. But this year it's looking great. We had three inches of rain over the weekend. I measured it and it has really kept the mint going strong. So I'll be using some mint in things today. Uh, often the mint is dried up by now and starting to look pretty sad, but it's absolutely beautiful. And where I've trimmed it, it's starting to put on new leaves, double the amount. So mint is one of the things I'll be using today. And also the lemon verbena. And lemon verbena is a very tender herb, but it's one of my favorite lemon herbs and it just has a wonderful lemon aroma. We have lemon balm which is starting to go to seed and if I have the time I will come out and trim that off because I had a lot of lemon and lime verbena coming up all over the garden last spring. So I don't really want it to go to seed. So I'll be picking that off and then we can still use the leaves and they too are lemony. They're a different type of lemon and this one is a lime lime balm, lemon balm, lime balm, and lemon verbena. And the lime balm has a, a little limeier flavor. And near it is some lime thyme. Again, a thyme that has a bit of a lime flavor. So if you want to have something that accents lime, those are the ones to use. We have plenty of uh, garlic chives that are starting to bloom. That'll have a white bloom on it unlike the regular chives, which are still usable, and they have a purple bloom. Uh, we may get a few purple blooms later in the fall if we keep getting rain, but uh, for the most part they bloom in the early spring, and the garlic chives bloom in the late summer. I have several herbs in pots, a rosemary and a bay leaf, and those will be coming in for the winter and I just left the rosemary in the, in the pot. I have another rosemary that's in the ground and they both seem to be doing about the same. I do water those if it does get dry, anything in a pot. The fennel can be used and this is a fennel that is a bronze leaf fennel, although my leaves right now are not too bronze. It's bronze when it starts out and these fennel leaves can be chopped and used. They're particularly nice with fish and they have the typical uh, fennel flavor, which is kind of a licorice flavor. More mint in front. This is chocolate mint, and it works very well in desserts, particularly chocolate ones, uh, chopped up. It's a nice accent. Mostly the work that needs to be done here is just harvest. A little bit of weeding, but fertilizing doesn't need any at this point. Things are working towards fall already. So we'll just keep harvesting them and enjoying them. Now I'm going to move over to the perennial garden. Another joy. Perennials, a lot of them are in full bloom again, and these are the summer, this is the summer bloom. Perennials are kind of divided into three seasons, at least in my garden. I have quite a few things that bloom in the spring. Then there's a little bit of a lull, and then we have the summer perennials, which are in bloom now, and then there will be some more different ones come fall. Right now I have yarrow, uh, daylilies, and platycodon, which is the blue, blue flower in back, uh, echinacea, which is the pink one, which is covered in pollinators right now, and a few little butterflies. You'll see quite a few bees around here. 
Uh, Heliopsis is the yellow daisy, and the grasses are in the back. Some of the grasses are starting to have some plumes of bloom. Those will turn a lighter brown as we move towards fall. I'm going to move down this way. The poppies have pretty much finished, and I took the uh, old bloom off, and I will save those bloom seedlings, seeds, the seedling part of it, and use it in winter decorations. I've put those into my shed to completely dry. We'll work on another poppy a little later. Moving down this way, we have the black-eyed Susans, which are a perennial favorite. More day lilies, these are white ones. The rose is starting, we fertilized it a couple weeks ago, and it's starting to put on more bloom. We have one nice bud and a lot of very small buds. Uh, in the back I have phlox and more lilies, and the lilies that are in bloom now, the yellow ones are tiger lilies, and in the back area here we have some snapdragons and the oriental lilies. And the oriental lilies are very fragrant right now. Uh, in the morning I can almost smell them out my bedroom window, which is quite a ways away, but they are extremely fragrant. More daylilies in back. My snapdragons, I had uh, a group of six here in a variety of colors, and I've noticed some of them lying on the ground, and some of them have pieces lying on the ground. And I also noticed a very nice little bunny rabbit in here, and I thought to myself, that's what's been eating some of my vegetables too. Where there's one rabbit, there are usually quite a few more. But there was one nice little bunny right back here, and uh, he had been working on the snapdragons. Last year they ate the asters that will be blooming in the fall. Uh, they really worked on those pretty well. This year they seem to like the snapdragons and my cabbage and broccoli. So I guess they have different tastes every year. Just like children, perhaps. Again, more lilies. This is a smoke bush. It's been cut down so that it uh, maintains a smaller shape. Last year it only had a couple stalks, which I pruned down, so this year it's getting a little fuller. It still hasn't bloomed. It will have a smoky bloom on it at some point. It's a, a plume that looks kind of like smoke, hence the name smoke bush. This one hasn't bloomed, but I do like the dark foliage, especially against the white lilies in the back. Moving down a little ways, we have lavender in bloom. This one uh, maintained the shape of the basket I put over it last fall. This year I think I'll just leave it out and not put the basket over it and see how it does. I may get a, a better shape from it. A new plant is another alium. And this is Alium Millennium. This has uh, been highly touted in the garden magazines, so I thought I would try it. It blooms later. It has chive-like blooms in pink and will be blooming later. This one is a stochasia, and I keep deadheading the pieces on that one as the blooms fade in hopes of getting more blooms. This is uh, an echinops, and you'll notice the blue blooms. These dry extremely well if I were to pick them. I really like to keep them in the garden as long as possible. When they're fully bloomed, they have little star-like blooms on these balls, and they're kind of spiny, and so it gives kind of a contrast to the spikes of the iris and the form of the lilies. More day lilies. And I think I'm cultivating a weed here, I'm not sure. I had planted some uh, fall blooming asters, and I'm not sure if this is one of those or if it's just weed. So we will know soon when it blooms. This is the poppy. I'm going to move this for a minute. This is one of the uh, poppies, and you can see its foliage is pretty much completely gone. 
So I'm going to cut this back entirely. Because it's adding really nothing to the garden at this point. There's one little plume down here left. I'll leave that. And we'll put on new foliage in the fall and bloom again next spring. But for right now it's adding nothing to this area. So I'll take it out and replace it with a pot of annuals. And this one is Nicotiana, and it will have big plumes with white flowers. And they're budded at this point. These I planted in the container in the spring. I started them in a milk jug outdoors early and then transplanted them to the flower pot to be placed in the garden to fill in when annuals were needed. I'm going back over here a minute and water some annuals, and I'll water that one too. These are some annuals I put in when some of the bulbs stopped blooming. And they will have red blooms on them. They're starting to have a few buds. They're an everlasting. And I will keep those watered and fertilized. I have mixed in some powdered fertilizer into the water to do these. Other than that, we'll just keep uh, cutting things back as it stops, if they say stop blooming. Uh, those, the poppies that we saw earlier will be cut back as they turn brown completely. And keep watering the annuals particularly. Most of the perennials can take care of themselves at this point. We haven't had any prolonged heat and drought. Our heat has been accompanied by adequate rain. So I don't really have to worry about watering the perennial garden very much at this point which is a savings of time and water. But I do have a few of the annuals that I'll go along and uh, water. A zinnia back here, again, one that I started early. And any pots that are placed in the perennial garden or any pots that are placed anywhere on your property, they will need water and fertilizer a little more often. I'll keep up with the water. The perennial geraniums are putting on a second burst of bloom. And this is another uh, spiny type plant. It's called Eryngium. And it too has, is kind of spiky, has a little different form, which contrasts well with the black-eyed Susans and the larger blooms of the platycodon and the bright pink of the uh, monarda or butterfly flower. Uh, the monarda right now does have a hummingbird moth on it. It's a moth that looks like a hummingbird, but if you look at it closely you realize it's not a hummingbird, but it is a moth. It, sometimes they're also called a clear wing because they do have clear wings, like a hummingbird. We've also had hummingbirds in the garden, and also monarchs, so you never know what you might see when you come out. Now, let's move on to the vegetable garden. Okay, uh, in the vegetable garden, we've got a lot going on. We can pick our kale, uh, cabbages, if the rabbits will leave them alone just a little longer. But the garlic's almost ready to pick. You can see it has some uh, yellowed leaves on it. I pulled one, which I'm going to use in the kitchen today, but it's not quite ready. It's still pretty tight as the bulbs go. I want to wait until 
it's just a little bigger and the cloves within the head of garlic are a bit looser in the head. These are still very tightly bound in the clove of garlic and it wasn't too large. So we'll give it another week, maybe two weeks before I actually dig the garlic and dry it for winter storage. I've removed the peas and the early lettuce because they had all gone to seed with the heat uh, and the peas had stopped bearing. We got a lot of peas this year right up through June but it's time now to move on to another crop. So I've added some compost to the row. I still haven't taken out the fencing. Hopefully it will keep the rabbits away from uh, my new seedlings here. And I'll just make a little seedling bed. And we can plant all kinds of things now for a fall crop. These are the same things that were planted early in the spring for the most part. But you can also plant some kale that may make it through the winter. And I'm going to start with some uh, Swiss chard, which I did not plant earlier. I planted the perennial spinach, which is a relative, which we're now using. But this is Bright Lights chard, and I'll plant those. The seed's fairly large, so I'll put them about three or four inches apart. Maybe a little less. And I'll put a rock where I stopped and cover those. And you can cover the seeds a little bit deeper now. Pat them in good. The main thing you want to do is make sure you keep them damp. I'm also going to plant a few more radishes. You can plant radishes every two weeks and have radishes all summer. And it doesn't take much space to grow a few radishes. And again, we want to put those about an inch apart. They're a smaller seed, so we cover them with a little less soil. And again, we'll find a nice rock to put where we stop there. And then some more lettuce. And I'm going to do a bib romaine lettuce. Seeds are even smaller. And we'll go up to that stake with that one. And then I'll leave some space. I can put in a few more things, but I want to leave plenty of space for some fall spinach. And that will go in in another two weeks in August, uh, planting of fall spinach and also some kale that will be consumed later in the fall. Kale is very frost hardy once it's up. And I already have kale over here, so I don't need it yet. So I'll wait a little longer before I plant the kale. But there, anytime you have an open spot, just put more seeds in and hopefully you'll get a harvest. Lately our frosts have not been occurring until sometime in October. So that gives us uh, another three months to garden and expect to have some things grow. Now I'm going to move over to the other side of the garden where I have some herbs, tomatoes, beans, all sorts of things. Actually the beans are over here just past the uh, Brussels sprouts, which the rabbits haven't discovered yet. And I have both yellow beans, and uh, these need to be picked pretty much every other day. If you like your beans young and tender, which I do, and I have yellow green beans and I also have green beans. And I made a note to myself, leave more space around the beans. 
they've been very hard to get at between the uh, summer squashes and the Brussels sprouts, which have grown a little more than I thought they would. And so we have a very uh, awkward space in there to get in there to harvest the beans. Nonetheless, I am harvesting them and we're enjoying them. Now I'm going to move over here. Over near the beans I have regular basil and also some lemon basil. And in here I have some lime basil, just three little plants, but it will be enough uh, to go with some of the other lime flavored herbs. I also have marjoram, which is rather small, but ready to be harvested soon. Some more cilantro. We had some early on the other side of the garden. This is a little later, and I've planted yet a little more two weeks ago, which has just come up. And I may plant more, even more. We like it, and it's very nice to be able to come out to the garden to pick it. This is dill. We had plenty of dill on the other side of the garden. Some of this is going to seed, but most of it is a type that I can dry for harvest, and it's ready to be picked and brought inside to dry. This is a new one for me called Mexican Mint Marigold, and I have a book of herbs that was written in, by someone from the Southwest, and evidently it is a, an herb that is frequently used in Mexico and the Southwest of the United States, and I thought it looked like fun to try. It's been very slow to grow here, but the hotter temperatures have kind of given it a lift, as you might expect they would. I got the seed from the seed library at the Norfolk Public Library, and I'm hoping that it will flower and I'll have enough seeds to return for next year's library. Eggplant and peppers are doing well. We're able to pick a few peppers along the way, and we also have the summer squash, and I've been able to pick zucchini and yellow squash as much as we really want. I didn't plant a whole lot of it because we don't use a whole lot of it. A uh, little zucchini, one or two plants, will give you all the zucchini you want and plenty for your neighbors as well. Tomatoes are uh, coming. They're not here yet. We got them in a little late. But with these, I do want to fertilize them. And what I'm going to put on them at this stage of the game is fish oil. And this is something that I like to use outside, but I don't like to use it inside on houseplants, though it says you can, and I'm sure they do wonderful with it. It smells like dead fish, so I don't find it very pleasant to have inside. It's a nasty brown liquid, and you add two tablespoons to each gallon of water. This is a two gallon watering jug, so a quarter of a cup was just about right. And I'm going to use that to water tomatoes. Tomatoes do take a lot of water. I don't want to fertilize my peppers at this point because then they will just grow foliage and not produce peppers. But the tomatoes can use a little lift at this time. Perhaps I should use some on the cabbage crops that the uh, bunnies are eating. Perhaps they don't like the smell of fish oil any better than I do. We'll give it a try. We're going to soon have some cucumbers because I see baby cucumbers on the plants. There are some little teeny ones forming. And it doesn't take long, especially if we get more rain, to have big cucumbers. So we have to keep watch of it once it starts, as do we have to watch the summer squash and zucchini. It doesn't take long for a squash this big to go to a baseball bat. So you need to really watch your crops rather closely at this time so that you get them at the maximum point of ripeness before they are overripe, especially if we have more hot weather. I've got a few flowers planted in here. A little bit of lettuce, which is kind of underneath. Another plant that I tried this year is tomatillos. We like tomatillo salsa, that's the green salsa. I thought, why not? So I, start, I planted them, and I'm pleased to see that they're starting to form the fruit. I had no idea how tall or large they were going to get. The package was not helpful. So uh, 
next year if I decide to grow them, not only will I give them more space, I will also give them some supports like tomato cages so that they can uh, kind of be self-contained. Right now they're shading the lettuce, which with the heat is not a bad thing at all. This is the remainder of my spring lettuce, my second planting. And a third planting is growing and we'll plant even more. We have another area here where I will put in even more crops, some lettuce, perhaps some more of the uh, spinach and other crops for fall. Kale particularly would be a good one. These are zinnias, they're budded. Uh, when we take off the first bloom, hopefully they will branch out and we'll have lots of flowers into fall. Now I'm going to go over by the fence. It's also starting to be seed saving season and this year I've gotten kind of interested in seed saving because I did work on the seed library as a member of the garden club. And this is a lovage plant and it has gone to seed. And so I'm going to save some of those seeds before I cut the heads completely off. I will just uh, save some so that I can share them. These have not completely matured. You have to wait until they're nice and brown, but before they drop, which they will. They smell delicious, like lovage. Anyway, I'm going to save some seeds, and I do want to point out that there is a seed library that will be happy to take some seeds if you save them, and also there is a seed saving lecture going to be held by the Garden Club at the library in early September, actually the second Wednesday of September. And one of the experts from the Mass Horticultural Society is going to tell us all about the botany of saving seeds and how best to do it. So I'm looking forward to it and we'll save seeds until then, but hope to learn more about it so that I can save even more and perhaps not have to buy too much seed in the future. The dahlias are coming out, and this is one of the first ones. It's just about gone, but it's a lovely color, yellow and pink kind of combined. Dahlias are something you plant in the spring, and then you dig them up in the fall and put them away for the winter and replant them come spring. And they've, I've been pretty successful just putting them in an unused bedroom where it's quite cool. We don't heat it in the winter unless we have guests and they seem to do really well in there. So I don't have to buy dahlias every year, and I've been able to divide them so that I have more than one of the same variety. I've also been trying to add some native plants, and we'll go into that more in another episode. But this one is one I started from seed, uh, and it's called swamp milkweed, and it grows well here. It, this is not a swamp, it's not even damp but it's doing quite well, and it's in here with some regular milkweed that just came up. Uh, it is a native to this area, as is the swamp milkweed, but the swamp milkweed has been very active with pollinators, butterflies, monarchs in particular, and the hummingbird moths. We've got a bumblebee and a hummingbird moth right here on it now, and more of the same. And I was hoping a monarch would come and light on it, but. Of course, if you have a camera going, they will be shy. But it's been fun to just sit and watch this and see all the insects it attracts. It's a very good pollinator plant, as well as one of the few things that monarch butterfly larvae can consume. And that is, it is an Asclepius, which is a milkweed family as well as your regular milkweed that you find along the road or in the fields. I'm hoping that we see some monarch caterpillars soon and maybe a chrysalis that we can watch until the monarch emerges. But this is a great plant to have. It's not as invasive as your regular milkweed, so it's a good garden plant, though it is a big boy. So I have it planted in this little area, which I have a number of other pollinator type plants. And it's fun to watch. Now let's head on back to the shade garden. Hosta is in bloom, some of it. Uh, hosta blooms throughout the summer. Some of it blooms early, some of it blooms late. Uh, this one's kind of in the middle. 
This one has purple blooms with little uh, stripes. It's kind of pretty. It's got little uh, white and purple stripes in the center. This is one that bloomed a little earlier and now it's finished. So it's time to not let it go to seed unless I wanted to start hosta seeds. But I think that would take quite a long time to get something of any size. These are the seed pods on the hosta and they will contain seed. And if you let them go to seed, perhaps eventually they will grow. But I'm going to take them off because I think it looks much better without those things up there. So once it blooms, it's finished. The shade garden, this is a, is a shade garden, but it does get a little bit of sun at some times during the day. So I would qualify it as mostly shaded. There are different degrees of shade, and when you buy plants, you have to watch that. Some of them will say shade tolerant, but then when you look at the label, it says part shade. And that doesn't mean you can put it under a pine tree back there and have it grow. So you do need to watch for that. Shade gardening is really nice, and having a high shade is better than low shade uh, because you often do get some sun that will come in between the trees and give you a little extra boost to the gardens. There are also some plants back here. These are the May apples that were at their best in the spring. And since it is, spring is gone, they're starting to turn brown. And as they do so, I'm just going to cut them up and get a little early start on fall cleanup. Actually, you don't even have to cut them. Once they turn brown, they just come up easily. And we'll just add those along with the hosta seeds to the compost pile. This whole area will soon be free of the May apples and also we have some other spring bloomers in here that again will start turning brown and we'll want to just get them out of the garden. This is bloodroot and it has a funny little leaf. It hasn't been eaten by anything, that's just the way they grow. And it too will start turning brown on the stems and we can pull that right out and put it in the compost. If you kind of keep up with it, it isn't as, quite as hard when you go to do the cleanup in the fall. I'm going to turn around to the pond. Fish are pretty active in warm weather, and so we feed them a little more often. And they have gotten to the point where they are trained to, when they see somebody coming up the uh, boardwalk, they come right on over and wait right in this corner because I always feed them in this corner. It takes it longer to get to the filtration system, so I'm not wasting food, but they uh, tend to show up whenever somebody walks up this way. They're kind of fun to watch. I don't see any frogs today. Probably they're all out hunting. They will come back later this afternoon and I'll usually find them sitting in the rocks someplace. I have both green frogs and leopard frogs and occasionally another kind of frog which I've yet to identify. I haven't seen any of them this year, but last year I had one that was something different. So it might have been a young toad. They too will lay eggs in the water and then move on to the land. Containers are doing well. Very pleased with this uh, plant. It has a little uh, pink in the middle of the green and white leaf. I'm going to be taking cuttings of that and hope I can preserve it for next year. It goes nicely with the pink impatience, and I will also be saving seed from impatience. I am continuing to watch them, and as fall comes closer, they will set seed, and at that point you can collect it and save it for next year. All of the impatience in my yard, I've got three uh, containers like the one in the pond, and several plants just mixed in, and this planter, and this one, all with impatience that I grew from seed that I collected last year. So you can do it. Uh, impatience are one of the easiest plants to start in about 
February or March and you'll have blooming size plants when it's time to put them out in May. They're very easy, they grow very easily. So it's one that I definitely wanna save some seed from. A lot of times when it's hot, I just enjoy sitting right here and enjoying my garden. You've gotta to remember to do that. It's hard sometimes. Uh, the least used thing in my garden are the chairs because I do tend to spend more time working on the plants and doing other things than just sitting and enjoying. This chair I use quite a lot and I do sit here to read, but other chairs in the garden don't get nearly as much use because I'm usually busy. But this is the season to look at your catalogs for spring bloom. And if you've had really bad luck with tulips, and that is very common because tulips in this climate don't tend to return. Uh, it's nice to try some of the smaller bulbs. There are a number of botanical tulips that are small tul smaller tulips that tend to be more perennial. And then there are other plants that also will return a little more dependably. Crocuses do better. Daffodils are deer resistant, which is a big advantage. Unfortunately, crocuses are a favorite of the chipmunks, and rabbits will kind of go after most anything, except daffodils. Daffodils are a sure bet, and they come in all different sizes, and they will bloom early, mid-season, and late. And if you go by some old fields in the spring, sometimes you see a clump of daffodils and probably an old house was there maybe a hundred years ago and those daffodils are still there. It's, uh, there are a few plants that will persist that long. There are several old roses that again you find at old homesteads where the house, everything's gone, but the plants have remained. I often see those if I go along the road and they're doing some demolition and you know putting up new shopping centers and that sort of thing. And there will be some clumps of flowers that have outlived their planter, certainly, and the house that they were near. So it's fun to look at the catalogs, do a little dreaming of spring. Hopefully you made a list of places you'd like to plant and colors that you'd like to use. I do put in a few tulips because I do love them, but I don't expect them to stick around more than a year or two. And you'll always have your best bloom the first year. But the other bulbs are fun, and there are a lot of little bulbs that will grow in our zone six area now. And they're really good to order because you won't be able to find them in the stores that dependably. And I have not been really thrilled with the quality of the discount store bulbs. They don't always grow. So it's good if you want bulbs and want to put in the effort to dig the hole to plant them, get some good ones and you'll be very happy with them. Now I think it's time to go inside and use some of those herbs that we picked from the garden this morning, along with beans and zucchini and a few other things. Okay, today we're gonna to cook some things using those lovely fresh herbs that we get from the garden, also the beans and zucchini that we're picking. It's really nice to be able to cook with produce that you just walk out in the backyard and pick. The first thing I'm going to make are some dill beans, and this is a way to preserve them, at least for a little while, because they all tend to come on at once, and you have a lot at one time. I'm not going to can these at this point, but I am going to make a brine. I'm going to make some pickled dilled green beans, and I'm going to start out with a cup of water and a cup of white vinegar, and I'm going to bring that to a boil rather quickly, and to that I will add two tablespoons of kosher salt or pickling salt. The kosher salt or pickling salt does not contain a starch to keep it from clumping, which regular table salt does. So it's best to use if you're canning something, it keeps it from getting cloudy. So we're gonna bring that to a boil, and while it's boiling, I have been uh, boiling a pint canning jar, and if I were making a large quantity of these and intended to put them in the canner, I would have, this still has a label on it, but a bit, and I have that, I'm putting it into hot water right now. 
If I were going to can them, I'd have a big kettle of boiling water here waiting. But I'm not. I'm going to put these in the refrigerator. So they won't be preserved for the whole winter. You can do the same process and put a canning lid on it and put it in a boiling water bath for about 10 minutes and then it will seal and you can keep it on the cupboard shelf. But right now I'm going to just fill this jar with green beans that have been washed and the ends taken off. And I tried to pick some of the smaller, tenderer ones. And we want to fill the jar right up. I'm dropping them in the water a little bit. And, but I did sterilize the jar since we will keep them a little longer in the refrigerator. The pickling brine that I'm putting on them, the vinegar and salt solution, will help them keep. It will also uh, cook them up a bit. But they will stay a little crispy by putting them in the refrigerator instead of actually canning them. And these will be for use within the next three or four weeks, right out of the refrigerator, as you would use pickles. And again, we want to get them right down in the jar. And we may not be able to fit in too many more. So we would like to have them down below that cap. I guess we've got a couple extras that fell in the water. I did put them into boiling water that I took out of the kettle just now where the uh, canning jar was boiling. Again, if I were doing a large quantity, I would be using larger pots. But I did not wish to do that today. But we're going to boil this brine, and the salt will melt. And while we're getting ready for that, into each jar of beans, obviously you would double or triple the recipe if you're making more of these jars of beans. I'll put one clove of garlic, a pinch of hot pepper flakes. They're going to be a little spicy, but not too much. You can put up to a quarter teaspoon in if you really like them hot. And then a head of dill, and we'll just tuck that down in to the beans. So they'll be garlicky, dilly, and a little bit sour. We want to bring this to a good boil. And then if you do any canning, this is a canning funnel. It happens to fit right into the canning jar. And it keeps you from spilling brine all over the place, or juice if you're canning peaches or tomatoes. We do need to get this up to a full boil. And there it is, a full boil. I'm going to pour that in over the beans. We want to leave a little head space on the jar, just a little bit, because we are refrigerating it. We won't need as much. And I'm going to put a plastic cap on them. If I were canning them, I would put on a canning jar cap, fresh cap and ring, then put it into a boiling water bath for 10 minutes until it's sealed. But this one is just going to be nice and hot, and we're going to set it here for later. And uh, we'll set that in the refrigerator, and after about a week, we will be able to taste them, and our beans will be pickled. The next thing I'm going to do is a chicken dish for supper, and it's chicken caprese and I need to get my chicken out of the refrigerator. Chicken is highly perishable and you want to keep it in the refrigerator until you cook it. You also want to take care in handling that you don't contaminate anything else with the chicken juices. The recommendation now is not to wash your chicken before you cook it, after you take it out of the package. The claim is that you can contaminate more by washing it than just using it. So I will be washing well after I have prepared the chicken. And right now, 
I'm going to heat up about a tablespoon of oil in the skillet and add a clove of garlic which has been sliced and we're going to cook the garlic in the oil for a little bit and then we'll take it out again when we cook the chicken and I'm going to slit the chicken in the middle And I'm just doing one. If you were having a dinner party, you could do more. This will serve the two of us because we have another dish that I'm also making. We'll spread out the garlic a little and cook it as we prepare the chicken. And into the middle of the chicken, I will put about two ounces of mozzarella cheese. few thin slices of tomatoes and I have used a small tomato for this and then we want to put in basil and again now that I've touched this basil we won't be able to use it raw because I have chicken on my fingers and we want to put in about four leaves of basil and put it together as best we can. You may need to use a toothpick to hold it together. At this point I'm going to wash for the first time, and probably of many, working with chicken. Cross-contamination is one way to get food poisoning and we don't want any of that here so we make sure to wash and also not to touch anything that's touched chicken to raw foods. Incidentally, that was a regular basil leaf. We'll also be using some of the lemon basil later. But I just want to have the garlic get a little brown. What we're doing is uh, flavoring the oil that we're gonna cook the chicken in. Incidentally, this is the garlic that I picked to see if my garlic was ready to harvest. Uh, it is not, but the garlic was definitely usable, and so we're using it. But it probably would not store very well, so we're going to use that head of garlic within the next day or two. In each of the dishes I've done today, and use garlic. Okay, I'm going to remove the garlic. And add the chicken. The knife and the plate will be sanitized and run through a hot dishwasher. We're going to saute this uh, rather high until it's browned, about three minutes on each side. Okay, we're going to flip it onto the other side. You may have to adjust it a little to cover that cheese. And we will brown it on this side. Now that it's browned on both sides, I'm going to move it over to the other burner to just simmer away with a lid on it until the chicken is completely done. And I'm going to use the thermometer to check it and make sure the chicken's at least 165 degrees, which is the proper temperature for chicken to be considered healthful and done. Now the next dish I'm going to make is a pasta dish with zucchini and I want to add a tablespoon of olive oil to the frying pan and it should be already fairly hot. And 
I'm going to salt and pepper some zucchini that's been sliced. Stir it up a little as we go. And we'll add that to the hot oil and we're going to brown the zucchini. Use a wooden spoon for this one. The chicken could also be put in the oven at this point if you want to heat up the oven, but on these hot days I don't think anybody wants to heat up their oven too much. And a little more pepper and a little more salt. want to just get this browned a bit. Just let it cook in one layer here. I've left the skin on the zucchini. It's very tender. You could also use yellow squash uh, if you don't like the zucchini skin or if it's a little older, but well, you might want to peel it. But I think it adds a little color and it will be tender by the time we're finished. I'm going to add to this now that they're starting to get a little brown. I'm going to turn it down a little bit and add some roughly chopped garlic, one clove, small clove. And a pinch of the hot pepper flakes again. More or less as you want. And we're going to just continue sauteing that for a little bit. And I'm going to turn down the heat a little bit too. Incidentally, this is about three quarters of a pound of zucchini. It was one zucchini from my garden. Small one. When the garlic is translucent, when the garlic is translucent, then we want to add the juice of half a lemon and the lemon zest, half the lemon zest from half a lemon, if that makes any sense. I guess a quarter of a lemon's worth of lemon zest, which leaves uh, another about a teaspoon in the bowl. And we'll cook that down for a little bit. And combine it, and then I'm going to add a half a pound of pasta which has been cooked. And we want to add a little bit of the pasta water. This is the cooking liquid from the pasta. And I'll add a couple tablespoons and about Let's see, I'm making a half recipe, so this would be a quarter cup of grated cheese, and this is Asiago. Parmesan would also work well. And we're going to stir that until the whole thing makes kind of a sauce. We may need to add more of the pasta water or less. It's a pretty quick dish. Lemony pasta. And it should get kind of creamy. As the cheese 
melts into the pasta water. Then to finish it off, I will add about three quarters of a cup of chopped herbs. And I'm using parsley, Italian parsley, lemon verbena, mint, and lemon basil. Quite a few herbs, so this is fairly full of herbs. And I'm going to add the rest of the lemon zest at this point, too. And we'll stir that up. And just heat it up a bit, and the dish is finished. We can turn it off. So this is lemony zucchini and pasta with lots of herbs. And we'll put that into a, a serving dish. You can serve it with additional cheese if you wish. right up. And I can garnish that with a little bit of the lemon basil. So that dish is finished and I think it's time to plate up the chicken as well. I'm going to take, use an instant read thermometer to take the temperature of the chicken and make sure that it's at least at 165 in several places, especially the thickest places, to make sure that we're having a safe meal as well as a delicious one. If it isn't quite ready, you can put the lid back on and cook it a little longer until the temperature is correct. Now it's time to plate it up and take it to the table. Our chicken's on the plate. We poured the juices over it from the pan and that garlic that we had cooked earlier in the oil that's nice and crispy, we use that as a garnish as well. Our pasta dish is ready with the zucchini and some more tomatoes on the plate because they are pretty much in season, starting to be in season, at least at the farm. Some of the farmers markets have them. And then for dessert, some chocolate chip cookies. And I have a little mint on these because I made regular chocolate chip cookies, but put in a half a cup of chopped mint along with the chocolate chips before I bake them. So we have mint chocolate chip cookies, and they really are minty. So this is our show, and we have also a flower arrangement, of course, from the garden. Always nice to go out and pick a nice bouquet to go with a nice dinner. So that's what we have today with things from the garden, a little... Uh, something for later, the beans. We could also have some fresh green beans with the chicken and the zucchini, if you wish to have a little more, and mint in the chocolate chip cookies. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television.